Hello, welcome. Uh, this uh, interview podcast um, is a chance to review the career of Rabbi Arthur Waskow. I'm his longtime friend, Herb Levine. Um, and I was prompted to do this uh, by reading a history of the civil rights movement in which uh, Arthur's name was mentioned several times. And I approached Arthur and said, is, is there any kind of video recording of the history of your career as an activist? Um, there, Arthur explained that no one had made such a recording before. And so we're making this for posterity. Um, and for anybody in our current moment who would like to know um, the history of Jewish activism, the history of uh, the Chavura movement, the history of the Jewish renewal movement, um, and also the history of the left in America since the 50s, and how all those things come together in the remarkable um, work of Rabbi Waskow um, and his production of 24 books and um, various magazines and websites that he's edited over the time. So I'm going to um, focus and try to focus this in um, in three broad areas: um, Arthur's political formation, um, his Jewish formation, and the way those two remarkably come together um, in the late '60s to create a dynamic that is still unfolding to this day, uh, 50 years later in uh, 2017, uh, when we are recording this. So I'm going to move this over to introduce Arthur. And um, you're going to look at Arthur primarily. And uh, I'll come back into the frame when I ask questions. So so Arthur, I, I think the, the we want to get this, um, we want to get more of your face there so we want to do that okay perfect perfect um so if we could hear a little bit about um growing up in baltimore um and the kind of neighborhood you grew up in and the kind of commitments that your family had that um influenced the kind of commitments that you took on in life oh i grew up in a 90 plus percent Jewish neighborhood of Baltimore. Um, mostly, maybe almost entirely lower middle class. I don't think, I think maybe my father was the only person who had uh, gotten a bachelor's degree in college uh, on the block. Uh, there were people who were small business folk, uh, et cetera. All the women were housewives. Uh, my mother, who was very bright and uh, had been a buyer for one of the uh, department stores in Baltimore, um, stopped working when I, uh, when I guess she was pregnant with me. I was the older of two uh, sons. Um, and the neighborhood was culturally uh, Jewish, religiously, not very interested, mostly. There was one from, that is, a uh, pious family up the block from us. Uh, my parents were married by the then Chazan, the cantor, at uh, an Orthodox synagogue about three blocks from us. Uh, at that point in Baltimore, you sort of connected with the synagogue on the basis of geography, not ideas. And so this Orthodox synagogue was where I went to Sunday school and became bar mitzvah, totally boring. Uh, I was taught to chant the bar mitzvah portion, but even though it was the portion about the creation of the universe, nobody uh, asked me to think about what that <laughs> meant. Uh, God forbid I should think about it. Uh, and um, we bought meat at a kosher butcher, but my family didn't keep uh, kosher. I mean, we didn't eat pork, but uh, we didn't keep kosher. Uh, but that was the place we got meat. And we were three blocks from 
a shocha, a ritual slaughter. We could hear the chickens being squawking as they uh, were slaughtered. Uh, and again, we bought uh, chickens who, who had been through the ritual kosher slaughtering process because that's where you got chickens. Uh, a farmer, Mrs. Wrigler with a station wagon with chickens in the back used to drive the chickens uh, up the block from us to the uh, shocha, to the ritual slaughter. And um, so it was very Jewish in context and culture, not especially religiously. And after my bar mitzvah, I thought it was really boring and dumb. I was very much involved in uh, in interesting thinking in my uh, junior high and senior high school, uh, and that was much more interesting to me. Right. So, what in that Jewish milieu that you're describing? Um, how would you um, describe the seders, the family seders that you had? Because you and I have talked about the yeah. uh, the importance of the seder to the right. to the uh, political formation of American Jews. Right. Um, well, I, as I said, I think that the um, the constant uh, unexpectedness of how Jews, who are quite well off in American society, continue to vote like liberal Democrats, or as it said, they might live like Episcopalians, but vote like Puerto Ricans. Uh, I think that has to do with the Seder and looking into the mirror once a year and seeing yourself as runaway slaves. So did you did that begin that for you? It began for me, absolutely. In fact, began with a kind of over an intense emotional overtone, which I didn't understand uh, when I was little. But what had happened was this. my the grandfather after whom I, name, I am named was, uh, uh, died very young in the uh, flu epidemic and then with tuberculosis, 1919, 1920. Right. And he died very close to Passover. And my grandmother decided to take revenge on God by not taking part in the Seder. Okay. So, and she lived with us for a number of years. So she, there was no Seder until I was about five or six years old, and my parents said to her, you know, this, we can't not have a Seder anymore. He's a, he's he's a, kid. a kid. He, he, needs, he needs, needs to learn. To right. right. So she would sit through the Seder grimly. Mm -hmm. I didn't know why she was so grim, but discovered it later. But, uh, but the Seder had this additional emotional intensity <laughs> to <laughs> a result of that. Oh, it was wow. always in English. Okay. Um, and it was always serious, partly because my father and mother were both active liberals. Uh, my father helped found the Baltimore Teachers Union, which was the only racially integrated element in the entire Baltimore public school system, right. which was totally racially segregated until right. 1954. Right. So he, uh, he was involved in that. and. Oh, we didn't give you a birth date. You were born. I was born in 1933. Right, and you graduated from college. You said in 54. 54 that's right. right. So at age 21. But so we're talking then about the late 30s and uh, 40s, 40s. And, 50s and early 50s. Right. Yeah. Right. So, um, and they both my parents were involved in ADA, Americans for Democratic Action. Right. Uh, and, and you said Eleanor were, Roosevelt had founded, yes, or was one of, right, one of the founders. Um, considerably later, like I guess in 1960, when I was working as a legislative assistant in the House of Representatives, um, my friend Mark Raskin and I, both of us legislative assistants, went to talk with Jimmy Roosevelt, FDR's son, who was a congressman. Okay. And when we uh, were in the office, he was on the telephone, with gestured to us to sit down, and he's talking on the phone, and he's saying, Mother, wh <laughs> what, what uh, uh, one of the Roosevelt kids was doing in West Virginia supporting Kennedy instead of supporting Hubert Humphrey for president uh, in 1960. Yeah. Uh, he said, yes, he's just, it's terrible what he's doing, Mother, but I don't know how to get him to stop. And I'm sitting there, and Marcus is in there realizing 
mother is Eleanor Roosevelt. <laughs> We're sitting in the same room with a guy who was talking to the saints. <laughs> so that was just an amazing right, thing. Right, right. But, okay, so... Uh, and Eleanor Roosevelt, that's a subject for another podcast, but... <laughs> But obviously, a great uh, humanitarian and a great uh, influence on an internationalist worldview on uh, on our interdependence as a human species. She right. she was a beacon of of all of that. Um, right. So, so my parents were these vigorous liberals, active active liberals. The teachers' union was small and struggling, um, and constantly being pissed on by the Baltimore Sun and other official voices of uh, the Baltimore community because teachers were not supposed to, they were professionals, they weren't supposed to join unions. Right. Um, but he stuck it out and they made a huge difference ultimately in the uh, Baltimore school system. Right. Uh, anyway, so, those, so for so them, therefore, the Seder, which was about freedom and justice, was really important. So that's a really important part of your formation that was just waiting there to be tapped in that's some right. way. Yeah. Right. So, um, so you prepared yourself, you went to Johns Hopkins and, and you prepared yourself thinking you might follow your father into public school teaching. Yeah, but let me say something more about my political formation. Okay. So in my senior year at my high school, which is called the Baltimore City College, but it's not a city college, it's a high school. It had hopes, and it's, it's the third oldest public high school in the United States. It had hopes of being what we would now call a com community college. But it was just a high school, and I was there. Okay. And in my senior year, I was editor of the high school newspaper. And that was pretty not so interesting. I mean, there was a routine, uh, but the stories were almost all routine. But in that last talk of my senior year, I got wind of a story I thought was really interesting and important. In, in our school and in every high school in the city, there was the Future Teachers of America Club. Right. And there was a citywide association of Future Teachers of America Clubs, okay. except there wasn't one. There were two. Uh -huh. One was black and one was white. Uh -huh. And when I realized this, I thought this is totally crazy. Future America, future teachers, come on. They're still assuming racial segregation. I thought that was insane. So I wrote an editorial saying it was crazy. And for the first time in the history of our newspaper, which was at least 100 years old, the faculty advisor, somebody ratted out to him that this uh, this. The editorial was about to get printed, right. and he vetoed it. So I went to the vice principal, who was a nice guy, and I said, come on, you have censoring the paper, you can't do that. He said, Arthur, don't be silly. In my lifetime and in your lifetime, this is 1950, in my lifetime and in your lifetime, the Baltimore City Public Schools are not going to get racially integrated. Forget it. So I well, felt pretty helpless. So I, but that was a, an important collision right. in my political life. I didn't think it had anything to do with being Jewish, but it was a really important um, political lesson, both about what ought to be and what was, and the power behind. What was and of course he, he was a man of very narrow vision because four years four later, years later right Brown versus Board right. of Education right. gave right. us the right. beginnings of integrated schools. Right. In right. fact, one of the delicious, one of the most delicious moments of my life was, let's see, six years ago, I guess, um, I got invited by the alumni association of that high school to become a member of their honor or something or other. And the perk was uh, among five or six other people who were being honored the same uh, time that year to give a six minute speech to the assembled student body. Uh -huh. So Phyllis and I drove down and from outside the school looked exactly as it looked in 1950. Right. It was built to look like a castle. And on a hill, it was right. called the Castle on the Hill, and it still looks that way. But once we got inside, 
They were now 60% of the students were black or brown, and about 60% of them were women. And in 1950, it was all male and all white, all uh -huh. male and all white. Wow. So I got to give my speech, and luckily I was the last one. Um, and what I said was, looks from the outside the same, inside totally different. Uh, I talked and I told the story, you told the story of my about trying this, to write uh, this editorial. Yeah. So what then, a great moment. So then I said to them, so if somebody you who has authority and maybe even you respect and admire says to you, for example, in my lifetime and in your lifetime, there won't be enough jobs for every American who wants and needs a job. You say to that person, we will change America. And then I did two or three more like that. I think the last one was, and if the head of some oil company says, well, we know that burning this oil is damaging the planet, but in my lifetime and in your lifetime, we're not gonna get off of burning oil. What will you say to them? And a thousand kids yelled back at me, we will change America. Wow. And so that's wow. the best speech I ever gave in wow. my life. Wow, what a great six story. Long. What a great story. Well, it's, uh, <laughs> less is more. <laughs> Brevity is the soul of wit, said right. Shakespeare. Right. Um, right. That's a great story. And it, and it puts so much together.